Welcome to another episode of The Dial-In with your hosts, Emerson and Brian. Today's guests are Ross and Didi from Miffy's. What happens when your life changes course? Not through mishap, the unexpected or unplanned, but through a deliberate intention that shakes the foundation of your entire world. What happens when the light of your passion dims and you're left to confront the monotony of the routine? Do you simply sigh and resign yourself to the path ahead, or do you take a chance, roll the dice, and allow yourself to pivot to a new passion? What if the passion you choose is able to merge with other passions, yet inexplicably would require you to move nearly halfway across the world? With your confidence and fearlessness tipping the scale over uncertainty and anxiety, you take a chance and make a move. And just as you're getting settled and your feet wet in the ocean of a new adventure, a pandemic hits and shuts the world and your passion down temporarily. Now what? We'll find out in our conversation with Ross and Didi. Thank you for coming all the way from Orange County. I really, really, really admire your guys' resiliency through everything that has happened over the past year. It's just been a lot. Oh, yeah. A lot. <laughs> For both of you, I would say. We chose the worst time ever to do this. Yeah, you could say that. (laughs) It's fine. What doesn't break you makes you stronger. I mean, right. And historically, you know, the food and beverage industry has always been extremely hard Uh, to even make any type of money, let alone during a pandemic. So I cannot imagine the things that have been going on in your guys' lives to now and how you guys imagined it or pictured it that it was going to happen from the UK to Orange County. Can we back up one second and just what is it you guys did during the pandemic? To rewind a little bit, we had every intention to start Miffy's Coffee officially in America of June 2020. And we had like our visa appointment book, March of 2020. And we were going to come out here to sign off the truck in March and sort out where we wanted to live, finally meet Tony and Emerson properly and had all these grand plans. The day before our visa appointment, the embassy shut the country shut down, everything shut down. We all know the story. So we, yeah, we planned to basically start our entire company June of 2020, ended up getting delayed until December, 2020 and started it, maybe not the height, but the tail end of the craziness of the pandemic, which was a challenge. What were you guys doing before that? Like what were your jobs before that? And how did it relate to like coffee making? Well, this is the thing, it doesn't at all really. I was a freelance musician so obviously I have my own band didn't make a lot of money doing that so I had to sell myself for the weekends doing private functions and events yeah pretty in much music. Yeah. Yeah. in music in, in music yes and I did also I've had part-time day job working for Dini's parents um so that was me but nothing to do with coffee though in answer to your question Dee, Dee was the coffee connoisseur out of us too i've just started drinking coffee the last year probably so wow yeah that's a huge jump i'm a tea man i'm english right (laughs) (laughs) how did you get into coffee uh, well, my career was not coffee. My career was cameras. Uh, begins with a C, begins similar. Begins with a C. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> a little further down the alphabet. But, a little mm, bit, yeah. yeah. So I worked with cameras, Canon cameras, and I uh, was a product manager there, and it was incredibly great and corporate and everything your career is supposed to be when you strive for ambition. And loved coffee on the side. Coffee enthusiast, hobbyist, everything. And always had dreams of doing my own business. I was brought up in entrepreneur family, own their own business, Everywhere in my life, there's self-employed people and it just always felt like the right path to take and working to pay them out didn't feel like the right thing to do. So just took the opportunity. I got made redundant. The music industry is incredibly tough just to do something that followed our passion and our dreams. And uh, this was it. But how did it come about? Like, I I think there's a big question and, and I think like a big interest in knowing that you went from a corporate job for a musician and then getting into a business that is a hard and be in another country even Mm. harder and then pushing through all that after the pandemic or during the pandemic to get over here like how did that all align um uh the initial idea actually was because we watched the movie chef and i know that sounds really cliche food truck you watch (laughs) chef but let's face it it was wasn't it it definitely was one of the original ball rolling moments yes and in terms of location we needed to do it somewhere hot obviously as well and we happened to come out here in September of 2019, we started right at the bottom of San Diego, 
right by the border and went right to the top up to Petaluma way, didn't we? And I suppose we just fell in love with the weather as well. <laughs> you lured us in California. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the weather and the beaches, etc. So we thought, yeah, let's let's do it here, you know. Because I'd ne- I've done a lot of travelling, but I've never lived anywhere else as such. I've always come back to the UK. So for me, it was just a really exciting adventure, and the timing seemed right with Dee Dee getting redundant. You know, I wasn't particularly happy with what I was doing. It's you know, it was a bit kind of Groundhog Day esque. So it was just an adventure that we both wanted to go on together, Mm. really, wasn't it? Yeah, and we've always travelled. We travelled across Europe, being English, you can travel to Spain in the same amount of time it takes you to get to San Francisco from San Diego. So we always travelled a lot, and wherever we travelled, we coffee shop hunted. And we started to fall in love with the same thing. Thankfully, that's, I guess that's why we're together. We like the same type of coffee shop and just saw an opportunity to create a space and an environment that makes us happy, but do it our way. Mm. And being both vegan, we wanted to create something that met the needs of a vegan without having to ask for that and still appeased the dairy people because they just like the drink anyway. <laughs> well, it's still circular in a way because you both ended up in a town where your original focus is very much a part of this town, whether it's with cameras and Mm -hmm. filming and photography or with music and whatnot. So it's like you started something new while still being surrounded by those other things that you love so much. Mm -hmm. COVID aside, it sounds like a win-win overall. Yeah, definitely. I guess that was by no coincidence, was it? The draw of music to LA and Emerson knows it. Ross constantly talks about how his famous friends were friends famous people he knows are up the road and how amazing that is and how some of the greats have played all around here in the music and to be surrounded by music and film and everything in this city you don't get that in Europe yeah, I remember when I first got to when I went we went to Venice Beach for the day didn't we and then we went down Abbot Guinea just as the sun was going down and I hate to sound too spiritual but I was just like this is just incredible because I'm not used to seeing anything like that really and uh from there on, I was just like, we got to get out here and try it. So initially, it was always, in my brain, Los Angeles. It was never Orange County or San Diego, where we happen to be working. So that's kind of strange as well. I mm. mean, it, it is an interesting town. A very interesting town, and for that matter, an interesting half of the state in Southern California. We're just so different mm-hmm. in a lot of ways from Northern California. So I can see the appeal. And then also travel, you know, traveling to the UK when I went to do my own thing and everything. The thing that that was really interesting is that in London, there was just not a lot of coffee, like good coffee. I saw a lot of Costa. I saw a lot of uh, mm. pret a manger, a lot of Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. And it, there were not a lot of like third wave shops. So how did you guys even begin to think about that or to formulate this whole thing around third coffee shop in a truck selling vegan milks? Well, it all comes from the European coffee shops, I would have said. Definitely. And I guess as well, where we live in Brighton, there is a huge third wave scene. There's a coffee shop chain, unfortunately, now called Small Batch Coffee. They're huge in Brighton and they were quite a good site for us like to hang out in and realize what the industry can do they sold out as many people do but there are still inklings of it and then exactly as ross was saying yeah that travel element everywhere we went we saw out the third wave and it was everything they were doing the compared to the likes of what we got in london when i lived there i could think of nothing worse than going to any of those shops you just listed and then when you see them in europe you're like oh this is so charming and magical and how can we capture all of this essence and then i guess chef was the impetus for the truck <laughs> yeah it was yeah and i think yeah, another thing as well is the truck seemed an easier win than what it would be to start trying to open up a shop in a another country we the were truck, naive <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> the truck felt easier at the time to do it hasn't been yeah and i guess there's something where we live and what we've experienced there is there is no truck scene I think it's growing and there are elements of it, but we've never seen it on a European level. And you come here and it's very glamorous and you think this is absolutely amazing to be able to take coffee wherever we want to take it on this little truck and drive it around and it'd just be great. And I fully blame Tony and Emerson for creating something so beautiful. Because we went and sought them out, you know, at the very infancy of our journey and saw how they were doing it and how they did it from, you know, third wave perspective, doing everything so beautifully and meticulously on this amazing truck. And it was, as foreigners 
you know, we did that same thing everyone does. We're like, let's go find the truck. Happened to be the day they day we were in LA. It was their day off. But it's fine. <laughs> Took us a year. We finally got to Farm Cup. Yeah, and it's just it's it's a freaking cool thing. So it just felt like let's create some magic in a mobile truck. So go back to that moment. So when you've got your truck and you're ready, and even if this is kind of like hypothetical, but so you're looking on the map and you're like, where do we go? Like, take me back to that moment on like how you decided where to start, which neighborhood, which street, roll on the dice, maybe they'll show up. It wasn't easy. It's the hardest part, definitely. I think when we did our initial drive from San Diego up to San Francisco, there were certain parts of the West Coast that we fell in love with and certain parts we didn't. So we definitely kind of knew like there was this, I don't know, if you take about, take away everything you know or or you experience in Orange County, San Diego and LA, just driving up that coast, there are spots that are just absolute magical bliss. And for me, one of them was Huntington Beach because it is just that long stretch of beach and there's open space and you can see all these places to park trucks. And so that was always a bit that kind of rang true to me. And then we're kind of like, well, Ross wants to be near LA for the music scene and the vibe. I lived in central London for a really long time. So I was like, I'm out of city. See you later. I need a beach. So it kind of just started narrowing it down, got the map out. Where can we commute to? Where can we still get to LA? Can we still get to San Diego? Can I still get to the beach? Are there still enough people around? And then you start plotting out where all the coffee shops are, mapping out all the truck scene. and Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is really hard though, because... On paper, you go, oh, I've got a county license. I can go anywhere, right, in the county? No, no, we have to get multiple city licenses, obviously. So it's like, where can and can't we go, you know? So we wanted to go by all the beach towns, really, because that's kind of what we saw our truck as, like the beach sort of coffee truck thing. But we were quick, quickly knocked down by quite a lot of councils that you can't be here and stuff. So by the time we narrowed it down, we just had a few locations, really, didn't we? So we just thought, well, we're just homing on them. So it was like... Huntington Beach and we had a San Diego license as well didn't we the other location was a farmer's market that we still do to today so we're like let's just let's just see how they go first it's been real trial and error it still really say, has the hardest part of running any food uh, yeah. truck is location yeah. regardless where you live where you travel to like there's so many things you don't know before you embark on the journey of a truck and just the simple things and going from where you live to where your truck is, where your storage is for your truck, because it's not where you park your truck, and where your truck is in comparison to your location you're trying to trade at. And just on a real simple level, if you think about trying to drive a coffee shop on the roads that are the American roads, which are very bumpy, and you've got water, electricity, coffee, everything going up and down, it's it's a constant daily challenge. So, yeah, all of that ends up weighing into your equation of, okay, well, actually... I can only really park within X amount of radius from where I have to park my truck, which has to be X amount of radius from where I park my house. Or you can spend seven hours on the road each day (laughs) trying to get to where you need to be. The proximity to the beach was the goal. And not just any beach. The state of Maine is stunning with its crisp air, but the crisp air comes attached to long, cold winters. In the case of Ross and Didi, the beaches of Maine were too much of a reminder of the coastlines of the UK. After a pre-COVID visit, they knew Southern California would be their destination, their new home. Despite the ongoing and persistent uncertainty and stress of COVID, this choice proved to be the gift that paved the way for their ability to build the foundations of their new life one day at a time. As one of the only coffee trucks in all of Orange County, they became, by default, the ultimate outdoor coffee experience during the time when outdoor service was the only service that was possible. When life gives you lemons, you simply turn around and make, well, bad metaphor. In the case of Miffy's, you make coffee. You get the idea. And now, back to our conversation with Ross and Dee. To me, like starting the, the truck was so easy to put it into a concept, but to actually execute was probably the hardest thing. And I think that you're taking something that has been so ingrained in our society that is a communal space to have and then turn it into a wheel shop or, you know, a food truck at this point and then selling it out there and then trading and everything. And then you kind of like bypass that whole point of like being able to sit down and enjoy it or like put your laptop down and everything like that. 
And I think that was one of the biggest problems that we would have people try to sit around us, but there was no space. Yeah. And, you know, people do want to enjoy it, especially you guys coming from the UK. I think there was a huge shift in that culture, probably from like drinking tea at home or with some type of pastry and everything and enjoying it rather than like, I need to go. I need to go. I need I have two seconds and then I just need a drip kind of a thing. So adjusting yourselves to that must have been a little bit hard. It was for us, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Definitely. We don't have drive through in England. Like... <laughs> It we doesn't, do ex- bit, but. yeah, but not in mm. not in the coffee world, really. No. Starbucks have brought it in, but we're exactly about that, and we still struggle with it. We we still have a problem with people. It's not a problem. It's lovely. People come to our truck and they stay for half an hour, thirty minutes, chatting to us, and they're like, "I'll just put a table and chair out." And it's like, "But we're not a bricks and mortar. I can't just put tables and chair out on the sidewalk, right?" Mm. And it is difficult because that's always what we've wanted to create: is a community yeah. and a space and chat and everything and yeah, the truck has forced us not to be able to have that, sadly. Yeah, but then that's also brought our desire on to have a bricks and mortar eventually because exactly as Emerson said, that's what we want. We want people just sitting at the shop, enjoying it, chilling out. We can go and chat and we just don't have that right now. Not that I'm moaning about what we have now, but, you know, the future, I would definitely say we grow out of the truck as such. If there's like a flip side to the coin of like, oh no, you need this city permit and you need that city permit, is that hopefully like you'll go through enough of it to where you can find the actual like community where you're going, that's our brick and mortar spot. Yeah. As opposed to like doing that outright. Yeah. You know, and starting that outright and going, oh my God, we just invested in a brick and mortar in a neighborhood that's not our vibe at all. I think that's an interesting journey that like you guys get to explore. It's probably some of what you and Tony have been through. God, yes. And kind of that same exploration of like, yeah, well, we're at the trading post every week and we see how that's going and where do we want to put Sunny? Well, there was always that definite like feeling of how are people going to receive us and if they're going to remember us, because there's always that offshoot chance that they're like, I've never seen a coffee truck before. Therefore, I'm going to go and try it, you know? And you might not see them again, and but you thought that one day that you were there, that it was a great day, and then you come back and there was not that amount of excitement around it. So there was always a really hard kind of like thinking about it and being like, okay, is this going to be a good day? And getting yourselves into that mindset of like, no, I hope it is a good day. If not, I don't know how we're going to take it. I always see it as like playing the food truck game on coffee is like playing a video game on extreme hard. Like it's yeah. because like you I go like around that. it and you're like, yeah. do I have the permit? Can I park here? Am I going to get a ticket? Are people going to come by? It, like there's all of these things and it's so hard. Yes. It is really, really it hard. Really and then to drive down that message of, I think for, for you guys to drive down the message of like turning into a vegan shop on wheels with coffee in Orange County. I mean, that is kind of like a, extreme hard level hard yes. kind of a thing I, yes how did you guys i know that you guys are vegans yourselves but like did you guys ever think that that was going to be kind of like a a hard sell in a lot of the people down there i don't think we did really because that when we went in 2019 it, you know i loved the vegan scene out here i thought it was just fantastic it was better than the uk at the time definitely wasn't it so i suppose i didn't really think that would be too much of a challenge and it you know, it hasn't been really, has it? I guess it's swings and roundabouts. I think we were naive picking Orange County in a way because we don't know the ins and outs of it. And it is the beauty of the truck. We can figure out what city we do and don't want to go to. Sometimes I think we thought it would be absolutely not a single problem at all. And I'm, you still do get those people that want cream and sugar. And as much as I can put oat milk in their drink and coconut sugar, which tastes delicious you know that sometimes they're not happy with it they're they're obsessed and they are too hooked on the fact they need dairy in that drink and that did take me by surprise thankfully it's like one percent of our customers that walk away it's not even that which is really good but yeah I probably did think it would be an easier thing or I would think that more people would value it I think there's a lot of people that see us and they don't instantly go vegan which was deliberate to a a degree because we didn't want people to walk past the truck and go, oh, they're a vegan truck. Don't want to go near them. I wanted everyone to approach our truck. And we definitely do. If you've not had oat milk before, have it. If you don't like it, drinks on me, not a problem, which is 
really works well for us in the past and at least by not being overtly one way anyone will approach us when i imagine most people too would just order uh let me just get a nice latte and then since you're not advertising it you're just kind of like here you go that is what we do yeah and then they don't even realize it absolutely yeah you get often the people that turn around and go what's in this right and you're (laughs) like like, oh it's oat milk like it's so good right i mean i had one customer who's He's been to us about, I don't know, 20, 30 times. You're going, oh, use oat milk to you. I went, yes, I've been giving that to you for months. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? I actually, you know, I commend, yeah. I commend both of you guys for that approach because I feel like so much that gets lost in the conversation of health and veganism and even like sustainability is just the way we conduct the conversation. Yes. And so we kind of like, we turn people off right at the outset. And so I think just kind of the way you've done it is very kind of discreet and kind of like, oh, it's nothing, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Enjoy your drink. Yeah. And it's yeah. only, you know, and then the people who do want heavy cream or half and half, it's like heavy cream. I mean, it still happens. Yeah. It does still happen. It still happens. And that's alien to us because we don't do that anymore. Yeah, England. I got well confused cream when I first got it. I was like, what, spray? You want spray cream in your coffee? <laughs> Cream. Like whipped cream. <laughs> you say milk, oh, so. Oh, got it. Cream. Yeah, it, yeah. Didn't, it didn't click with me. I yeah. think you guys call it double cream. That's what it is. Well, yeah. double cream to us is like we something you put, put on a cake or something, right? Or smother your strawberries in it on a yeah. summer's day whilst watching the tennis. Cream, that's cream. Interesting. That yeah, it doesn't very, go in coffee. Very British sentence Isn't that I it? just heard. Yeah, I thought you'd enjoy it. I love it, it, though. I mean, to me, like, it's switching from a dairy based business model to an alternative business model, at least in LA, it made sense. There, there was just such such a yep. profound movement towards doing that. And there were just so many customers that were already saying, oh, I want oat, I want almond, I want... I mean, I still get some people who are like saying the weirdest types of milks like cashew and mm. walnuts. And I'm like, where did you have that? You know, that, <laughs> that it's making you think that, I, that we would have it. But, you know, I, I think the movement and the trend has been going towards those things. Now, I am from Orange County originally. And when I go down there, it's kind of like if anything it's soy milk or at this point oat milk in one you know in one or another and i feel that it's really really great that you guys are just sticking to the guns of like oat milk and alternative milks because when i see that i'm like that's great they at least know the product they know who they are and then they can go from that but within all that apart from your lifestyle i think there's a bigger opportunity of like making sure that we understand the why for my business it was the sustainability point of view there's just so much dependency on milks and dairies and things like that, that we were like, I think it's a good choice to go that way. I don't know how you guys came to it. We'll be right back to our conversation with Ross and Didi after this message. Today's episode is brought to you in partnership with Chobani. Chobani's mission is making better food for more people. And they've brought that mission to non-dairy by crafting the ultimate oat milk for food service. Chobani Oat Barista Edition. It's plant-based, gluten-free, non-GMO, and vegan-friendly. Their formula was crafted for superior performance and versatility. Whether adding to black coffee or creating the perfect micro-foam, Chobani Oat Barista Edition will satisfy your caffeine needs and delight your customers. And now, back to the episode. Can either of you pinpoint kind of if there was a, a moment or if it just kind of gradually happened to where... You shifted into being vegans and the health standpoint and then how that translated into your business from like a sustainability standpoint as far as just how those two merged. Like if you can remember a specific example or an, even an influence to where it was like, oh, no, this makes sense to me. This is what I or we want to do. Yeah, I think my my first one was when I was in Madeira and I saw uh, a cow about to go to slaughter mm-hmm. and just fighting for its life. And I suppose I just thought, Ah, it's pretty cruel. And uh, I just said to Dee Dee, I'm just going to try it for a bit, didn't I? Yeah, and I do the cooking, so I was like, well, <laughs> I'm not cooking for two. Let's tell you now. So that was probably, yeah, a turning moment. And I think the sustain- sustainability for me has always always been an agenda, probably before veganism was. I've always been the person that will carry cutlery or Tupperware's everything, reduces plastic consumption, all of that. So veganism just came hand in hand with it and I don't think there was ever a question with our business that we would do anything against those two ethics morals standpoint way of life as it were and even the way we conduct our business now for me doesn't it's not as sustainable as it should be I still don't think that the plant-based industry has done enough to be sustainable 
I know Emerson experiences it every day. We go through 50 cartons of oat milk on a weekend on one day. I sent Tony on Instagram a link yesterday or two days ago. Somebody, I think it was somewhere in Europe, they were recycling their cartons by like, I guess they were washing them out mm. and then cutting like holes in the middle and letting it serve as a drink carrier. Yeah, oh, that's cool. And they were yeah. just repurposing it yeah. in that way to say, oh, well, we've got now this empty oat milk container. Yeah. Oh, that's so smart. Let's just clean it out. Let's kind of triangle cut. And then now it's a drink carrier. Yeah. People ask us every day for drink carriers and I don't have them. Yeah. So that's now my new thing. So that's your new thing. <laughs> there we yeah. go. Yeah. But back to the business, it was never really a question, was it, of would we ever do business with dairy? No. The question always got posed to us, what do you think you're doing? You're cutting off a market for sure. And we had to justify our standpoint. But yeah, we never had that ta-da moment, that moment of we definitely have to do this. It just was this. One of the moments I had was getting my father onto oat milk because he's very meat and two veg in his whole way of like kind of thinking. So I used to make him drinks with oat milk and he'd go, oh, it's just really good, really good. And I thought, well, if I can convert, not, not it's about converting people, I don't want to put that message across. But if he can enjoy the drink. If he can enjoy the drink. That's the Orange County coming it. out. <laughs> Got it. If he can enjoy the drink, I was like, yeah, this is, this is going to work, I think. Right. You know, he was my little guinea pig, if you like. Because I think at the end of the day, as business owners, you're trying to appeal to everybody, right? So yeah. now you have kind of like a double whammy on your guys' hands, which is like a truck, right? Uh, that goes around and then you have like a set, you know, place to be. Or sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And then you're kind of like also saying, well, the traditional way of drinking was this. Now we're changing it to this. So you kind of have like a very interesting business model yeah. that needs to be perfected, you know, for people to be like, oh, I love this. Or... I'll try it again until maybe I like it or I like the look or I like their accents. They're Australian. Yes, we got that every day. They're from New Zealand. It's really funny. No one can pinpoint where they're from and it's just, it's yeah. the most interesting thing ever. Well, yeah. it's almost like when someone says you're cutting off a market, you know, it's almost like your response is, well, that's not our market. Yeah. But then at the same time, you know, what, what Emerson and Tony does, it's really smart. And I'm assuming you guys do something similar is that since you understand that that market exists, like the... I guess we'll call it the caramel frappuccino market. We'll call we don't that, say those words. We don't say those yeah, words, but no, we, no. we say that. Sucks. But the, <laughs> where, where it gets kind of like reinterpreted mm. is when you see something like their, you know, monthly specials menu. Yeah. And it's like the camper and it's got all these things that are all like healthy, organic mm -hmm. ingredients. Mm. And the way the language is presented visually and then the words, it's so subtle and so indirect that people don't realize that they're having something that's better than and more healthy overall yes. than a caramel frappuccino with extra caramel and extra whip. Yeah. And so it's like a way of saying, you're right, that's not our market, but we're going to find a way to reach out to that market if they give us a chance. Yeah, absolutely. I think maybe before we came here, or we've always got pushed, people always said, are you going to do the Starbucks versions of drinks? Are you going to do the heavy sugars? Are you going to do the whipped creams? And I've just wanted to do really good quality coffee and I've never been interested in that kind of crazy world. It's always felt a bit alien, but we did start honing in on like a specials menu and all sorts to appease to those people in exactly the same way Tony and Emerson do. It's like, okay, it's it's not quite laden with sugar, but it's still going to give you a flavor. It's still going to give you the closest thing to that, but with our touch, you know, organic, good, high quality, well-sourced ingredients that will give you a treat without giving you diabetes, hopefully. Although I'm not responsible <laughs> for that. Is that on the treat. menu? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll get sued for that statement, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes that can be a challenge, you know, because we get people saying, you know, if you got like a 30 ounce or a bucket full of cold brew, and I'm like, we just do one size here, you know, and they're like, mm, go on then, I'll try it. But uh, yeah, the we kind of... people that aren't happy, just buy two. Thank you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. We kind of stuck to our guns on the whole, we call it like the European size, and we don't go bigger than a certain size. And I, don't, I just didn't really want someone walking around with a giant bucket of coffee with our brand on it, really. Yeah, most of this area went through that in third wave, probably mm. eight to nine years ago when third yeah. wave was really blowing up mm. and people were like, that's your cappuccino? Well, I still remember my first experience when I went to Blue Bottle. I had an interview in Navid Kinney. I want to say maybe I was like 20 years old. So this was 10 years ago. So I went there and I was like, oh, well, can I get a drip? And they're like, we don't have that. We only have a <laughs> We have a pour, pour over. over. <laughs> I was like, I don't even know what that is. And then they told me the prize and I was like, whatever. 
And uh, I remember that I got it in a 12 ounce cup and I was like, no, 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 can I get a bigger one? And they're like, we don't have anything bigger. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, why? Starbucks does, yeah. but there's no <laughs> Starbucks here. But you know, it was kind of like that, I, that realization that there is another side of coffee that it's not just hyper consumption where you're gonna get that high off of that huge sugar and caffeine drink. Cause that's what I think the American consumer really wants, right? Some of the times. It's that very caffeinated, super sugary, very heavy on the cream kind of drink. And then you guys are serving completely different. Yeah, because to me, it's still only a double shot of coffee. You know, you get a 20, 30 ounce latte. It's just milk. It's just full of, that's what I do try and explain to them. I say, look, the coffee's still, still there. It's just, it's just slightly less milk. Yeah, I think the more yeah. often you, you focus on flavor and quality ingredients, the more people, like the ones that do appreciate it, they, they, they do come back and they respect it. And yeah. they are appreciative at the end of the day that probably that pour over you had tasted a lot better than your 20 ounce strip you have normally from that other coffee shop. And, you know, and then you were convinced and here you are 10 years later with right. a better coffee shop. I want to go back. You had talked about how you feel like even with what you're doing now, is not as sustainable as you want it to be. So like what's, if you guys were to have like your, on that checklist, your top three of like the next things you wanna either implement, whether it's like within your company itself or in extension to your customers, what are those three things that you kinda of wanna do? My dream is number one, say dream. I wanna have um, Crate. I've seen them before they exist, one of those big machines that we get our oat milk out of. So rather than using cartons, that's our biggest waste. Most we have two or three bin bags a day of cartons that we put in a recycling bin. Where they then go, I don't know. Uh, I think that was one of our biggest shocks coming to California, the supposed like vegan centric, environmentally friendly place of America has the worst recycling I've ever witnessed before. So like seeing all of that definitely suddenly made me go, we have to do something better with our waste. So I'd like to get rid of the carton side of the business and find a way. It's very difficult on a truck because you're limited with resource and stuff. So I guess if I'm taking out the confines of that, that's definitely something I'd want to do where we've just got a bigger system or bigger container storage and maybe we get the milk delivered in a different method that means that we can pour it straight out of that type of machine. Like I worked for Intelligentsia way back in the day, like going on 10 years now. And at the time when the milk would come in, we would put it in glass milk containers mm -hmm. that would then be in our ice buckets yeah. at the machine. And it was that that was like a way that we could control the recycling aspect of that, those containers and that plastic, which was the same thing that we would do with the beans. We would get the five pound bags of beans and we'd put them in these big glass mason jars that were probably better airtight mm -hmm. than the bags once the bags are opened. We really try on the small wares as well, you know, putting every, trying to put as much as we can in the, the paper cups um but there's still a little element of plastics that we use yeah but even the recycled plastics were a bit of an eye opener wasn't they yeah i think there's a there's a misconception here isn't there if you put the word compostable on your item or uh, biodegradable everyone thinks oh that's amazing that's a really sustainable product but lo and behold if you don't put that in the right facility that's just going to end up in landfill like everything else so we do have plastics on our truck and they're the number one you know, the one in the little recycling symbol, which means if they go to the recycling center, they'll actually get recycled and reused. They're the easiest one to recycle. And that, you know, took us some education and learning and it makes sense to do it that way. But I would like to as well, like number one is definitely, we go through so much oat milk, those cartons have got to find a way to go or be reused better. And then number two is the small wares. I'd like to be able to offer a recycle back scheme. So if you, you know, bring your cart back and we all will make sure this goes to the right place. We do, like a lot of people do, the discount if you bring your own cup or whatnot. But because we're not that coffee shop, I can't do anything in ceramics. I can only do bring your own cup. So doing something more and actually taking back the containers, if, especially when we're at like farmer's markets where people grab a coffee, they walk around. Right. They're still in the same areas. After they, they could happily put that cup back in my trash. And then doing something with that cup to make sure it goes to the right home or the right facility is a big one. Yeah, we've started to... Do, with, do that with the coffee grinds, haven't we, as well? Yeah. Giving yeah. them to the farmer's oh, yeah. market at the end Absolutely. of the shift. They've got a plot of land down the road that yeah. they grow fruit and veg yeah. on. Yeah. So we give them, them, give them our beans for compost. I imagine even in this neighborhood, you guys could find, if you like had a sign or advertised it, you'd have somebody with their own little home garden of some yeah. sort. And yeah, they'd be like, exactly. oh, I can have your 
Your coffee grinds? P yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Save me a bag. Or well, the yeah. farm cup face scrub. I can see it coming. That's another thing. Yeah. That is always a good idea to reuse all of your grounds. Yeah. I know that a lot of shops do that. But I think fundamentally, the business model of coffee is kind of all over the place in sustainability. And it's, yeah. and it really falls down to the owners of, you know, each coffee shop. But at the end of the day, the beginning stages of the coffee farming and exporting because none of that coffee you know comes out of anywhere near the united states so transporting it here with you know fossil fuels from those very far-flung places does cost a lot so we need to mitigate 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 until the point that we're giving it to the to the consumer so i see the the drive you know to switch to alternative milks to really reduce that making sure that we use all the plastics and i'm putting a little bit of the blame to all of the alternative milks out there because you're right a lot of those plastic elements the tetra packs the linings all of those things are not recyclable so there's a lot of things and i don't know how we see the coffee industry switching from now on because you know like it's starting in the epicenter in certain places like la like san francisco and all those places where the majority of the things are plant-based i would say even seattle so I don't know how it's going to expand and I don't know how we're going to be able to see it kind of like shift itself away from all of these things now that we know that it's like a really heavy burden. And even our roasters, like roasting machines do create a lot of pollution. Yes. They create a lot of uh, microparticles that do, you know, get around everywhere. So there's a lot of things that we need to create a better awareness over. And I don't know how we're going to see it. I don't know when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. I mean, I feel like the one good thing, like if there's one potential silver lining kind of coming out of COVID, you know, as you guys kind of decide your brick and mortar and whatnot. I mean, the downside to COVID is like, everything's been to go mm -hmm. just by default. Everything's yes, been to go because right we're closed. You <laughs> yeah. can't hang out, support yeah. our business, but you got to go, <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know? Yeah. And now yeah. like it's, as we're slowly coming out of that, you know, being able to be in a position to have your brick and mortar spaces and want to encourage people to say, no, 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 don't, don't go come hang out. You know, maybe to the point where you say we don't offer to go cups unless it's your own. You know, everything yeah, else is just like ground, yeah. sit down and enjoy your cortado. Sit down with your friend and do your cappuccino. I love that idea. And I'm going to throw the name out there again. They did a great job. Right. And we're going to talk about Starbucks. I remember this great lesson and it came from no other than the farmer in Peru. Mind you, there's no Starbucks near their their place of, you know, coffee making. <laughs> by far. I think there's like two in Lima, maybe more now. But he was like, the only reason why we have shifted our production from a, you know, quantity to a quality is because Starbucks introduced the idea of a latte to enjoy in their shops. Now their model has been shifted to a to-go model, right? It's not as comfortable to sit down in the chairs. It's not as necessary to enjoy a leather sofa in a very like dim lit place to enjoy your cup of coffee while listening to a good song. Now it's more like, hey, I need to go, I need to go, I need to go. And so the consumerism really took over their business. But it is because of them that we enjoy this kind of idea over the third place over the let's sit down let's enjoy let's talk to the barista let's get to know why you are vegan why are you importing single origins why you're roasting a certain way and i think covid really took that away from us because it became a survival game right we were trying to just survive as businesses to kind of like push our product without getting so far away from who we were that it kind of like messed everything up and i see it in every business i mean whole foods a long time ago didn't have a lot of their plastic silverware and they switched over to compostables and now it's like you can't eat there anymore so you have to kind of like grab plastic 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 so it kind of like shifted the idea of what sustainability is nowadays and it's really just just it breaks my heart sometimes it really does it's like we put the brakes on it didn't we like the, the world oh, was absolutely. moving forward massively in sustainability and put yeah. the brakes on it completely yeah i say we even kind of made it a little bit worse you know like seeing a disposable mask on the floor now is super common or in the ocean or whatever even the juxtaposition here in la in early 2020 after no one had been on the roads for like three weeks and i remember going outside and walking around going is this Los Angeles? Yeah. <laughs> like I can feel the cleanliness in this air. So it's kind of like a weird juxtaposition of like, we're doing better on one end for a while, but we're really doing worse over here. Yeah. And just finding the ways to get back to that. I mean, I think we'll go ahead and get there someday. Yeah. It'll take time again. I mean, we, pr yeah. we probably overproduced all of these things that we were going to need to get through the time and now they're there. So now we're going to have to use them up. 
at one point or another. And that includes plastic bags. I mean, remember in LA, we actually banned plastic bags and then they were like, you were supposed to bring in your own stuff and then COVID yes. started and it was plastic Straight bags back. all That's over true. again. Yeah. You know, it was like the straws, no straws, no straws are back at it again. And it kind of just reintroduced this whole pollution problem. And I do remember those early days in the pandemic where I was like, oh my God, I can see the sky. I can see the Hollywood sign from yeah. you know downtown, which usually never happens. And now it's like, back at it again. I Where's can't the sign? see anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say in closing, here's my question as we wrap up. For you guys, what is your kind of three-year outlook for Miffy's? Like, where do you hope to be in three years? Have you figured out a neighborhood? Or are you still just... We're still not sure on the location exactly, but I think one thing that we would like to do, if it's possible, is do a slightly off-the-grid coffee shop. So like shipping container, like run by solar battery, because that's what our truck is running off now. We ditched our generator and uh, it's running off batteries and solar now. So that gave us a real idea for bricks and mortar, didn't it? Yeah, I think that the, the answering where is an unknown. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, answering the, the what is crystal clear for us. A bricks and mortar that's as off the grid as it possibly can be, the helps us continue in the good paths that we've created in sustainability and making good coffee and creating a social environment for people to hang out and feel safe and chat to two lovely British people. Um, and <laughs> we want to make sure we get, get to a point where we can start sourcing our own beans and roasting as well. And, you know, hopefully following in Tony and Emerson's footsteps a little bit in making sure that we're curating the right product from the farm and, and we're helping to look at that bigger picture of coffee and sustain sustainability, like, we can control a lot of what we can control in our own space with cups and outlook containers and everything else. And right now we're just doing what everyone's doing, trying to hustle to survive. So, you know, you can only concentrate on so many things. And definitely that three-year plan is, is create the most sustainable coffee space we can create, ticking as many boxes as we can, but covering that broad spectrum from cups to beans to electricity, how that's produced and everything. California's got a massive bright thing in the sky that creates an insane amount of energy and we have to use that more and we do on our truck as Ross yeah, said yeah since putting the solar panels on our truck we're getting 50 percent of our power just from the sun and it's just fantastic you know we was always told by most of the truck fabricators here that it wasn't possible to do and then we've done our own research got in touch with the electrical companies and now we have a uh, set up by victron it's batteries, inverters, and solar panels. So. That's great. Yeah. And where can people find you on socials if they want to look for you guys? At Miffy's Coffee, which uh, is M-I-F-F-I-E-S <laughs> Coffee uh, on Instagram, Facebook, social and media. Website, miffyscoffee.com. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you, too. Thanks Thank for you. coming by. Of course. Thanks, Thanks for coffee.